Now the, the, the question is, is the stress here equal to the stress here? So who says yes? They're equal? No? Who says no? So it's not applicable? <laughs> <laughs> So the, the the problem with saying that the stress is equal to one unit, I cannot. If I ask you for the stress at a point, the stress at a point, you cannot just give me one number. If you give me one number, then uh, then there is an error here because the stress really depends on the area that you're looking at. So if you were Looking at this plane, then indeed you can say, well, on this plane, this side is pulling this side with a stress or a force per unit area in the horizontal direction one, in the horizontal in the in the vertical direction zero, and in the third direction zero. So there's a force a unit area acting here that's equal to 1. On the other hand, if you look at another plane, let's say, if you look at this plane, for example, let's look at this plane, the material on the top is acting on the material at the bottom with the force per unit area vector that's equal to zero, zero, zero. So the stress acting on the spin is actually zero. So the value of the stress on a plane, the, the value of the stress really depends on the orientation at which I'm, uh, I'm looking at. If I look at this plane, which is oriented, for example, at 45 degrees, <coughs> then this part is pulling this part with a force per unit area That's equal to 1, 0, 0, multiply by cosine 45. Because the area here is bigger, so the area here is bigger, and, and so the force per unit area on this plane is bigger, it is small. takes us to, two, uh, to another concept which is normal stress and shear stress. If I consider this plane, this plane has only normal stress and has no shear stress because this plane is being pulled from one side by a force that's perpendicular or by a stress that's perpendicular to that plane. When I look at this inclined plane, this plane is being pulled by a force that's not perpendicular, so it has a normal component and a shear component. And so if it happens that this beam is made out of two parts, like this, then you need something to take both components, and so you put some, maybe some bars in, in this direction and some bars in this direction or shear studs, something to take the shear component and another thing to take the normal component. So you've got two components of the force acting on this plane. 
one perpendicular to the plane and one uh, parallel to the plane. So what we said is the, the, the I cannot say, I have to ask you for a plane and then you can tell me what the force acting on this plane is. And that is the function of the stress matrix. So the stress at a point is described by nine numbers. Maybe a lot of them are zeros, but if you ask if I ask you about the stress at a point, you can't just give me one number. You can't just pick any force divided by any area and say, here's the stress. You have to give me nine numbers. And the function of the and the function of those nine numbers is to form a tensor or a matrix or a linear operator. Now a matrix, the function of the matrix is to take vectors and give me other vectors. So what does it do? Well, if I know the plane, if I know the unit norm perpendicular on this plane, the function of the stress matrix is Given this plane, and given this normal, I'll give you another vector that's equal to sigma transposed by n, which I call Tn, which is a vector giving the force per unit area. So the first thing we have to define is this force per unit area. The force per unit area, traction vector, depends on the plane. So if I have a beam and I split it apart, then the traction vector small area, the area is equal to delta A, is equal to the limit of the ratio between the force vector, delta P is the force vector, acting on the area delta A, and the limit as delta A goes to zero. And the reason why we take the limit is because if, if the stress varies, for example, or if the force varies, then the, 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 the traction vector will be equal to uh, the limit. As we will 
C in a bit, this Tn, I can only find it by using that stress matrix multiplied by whatever N is, the, the unit normal to this area. Knowing the stress matrix, I can find that traction vector. So let's define the components of that matrix. To define the components of that matrix, I'm going to extract a small cube from the material with very small dimensions representing the point that I'm uh, looking at. And, and I'm going to uh, look with a magnifying glass. And at this point, I'm going, or for this cube that has very small dimensions, delta x1, delta x2, delta x3, I'm going to look at the plane with normal E1, the plane with normal E2, and the plane with normal E3, and I'm going to find the traction vectors on those three planes, because the traction vectors on those three planes are enough to tell me the traction vectors on any other plane. If I know what the traction vector is on this plane, and on, on the top, and on the one facing me, I will know any other traction vector on any other plane. And I'm going to define the component of the traction vector in, in this direction on this plane as sigma on 1. The component of the traction vector on the plane with perpendicular E1 in the direction of E2 is sigma on 2. The component of the stress on the plane with perpendicular 1 and in the direction of E3 is called sigma on 3. This is the, the component of the traction vector on the plane with perpendicular E2 in the direction of E1 and so on. Sigma on 2, somebody would define it as sigma to 1. Now it doesn't really matter because it's symmetric, but when I say here sigma on 2, I mean the component of the stress on this plane in the direction of 2. Another text might define this as sigma to 1. They are equal, but you, you have to be clear on the definition. So now what we want to show is that indeed this is enough to give me the traction vector on any inclined plane. Now I know the force on a perpendicular plane, I know the force on the top plane, I know the force on a third plane. So I know the forces on the plane behind, the, the plane here, and the bottom plane. So I know the force per unit area on the shaded plates. And now the question is, can I use those to find the traction vector on this inclined plate? So the, the, the the plane in the back is called, it has an area of A1. The plane in the back there it has an area A3. The plane at the, at the bottom has an area A2. And the inclined plane has an area AN. The unit normal of this plane is equal to a vector N. So all these are real numbers, and N is a vector. 
Now there is a relationship that you should prove using the cross product that the area of this inclined plane multiplied by its unit vector is actually equal to A1, E1 plus A2, E2 plus A3, E3. A1 over AN, E1, plus A2 over AN, E2, plus A3 over AN, E3. And these components are equal to N1, E1, plus N2, E2, plus N3, E3. So I have defined the general plane with a perpendicular, uh, with a unit normal N, and I found the relationship between its components and the areas of the different plates. And what I'm looking for is what is Tn? So I'm going to use Newton's equations of equilibrium. the forces in the direction of E1, of E1, sum of forces in direction of E1, the sum of forces in the direction of E1, which are equal to the mass multiplied by the acceleration in the direction E1. The sum of forces in E1 are equal to the ball. Sigma on 1 multiplied by A1 plus Sigma 2 1 multiplied by A2 plus Sigma 3 1 multiplied by A3 These are all in the negative direction plus Tn1 multiplied by the area An, the inclined area. Now there are other uh, body forces as well, or let's assume body forces are equal to zero. by an acceleration g1, which, what, which is what we call uh, body force g1. So this will be equal to the mass multiplied by g1 equal to the mass multiplied by the acceleration component number one. Now the mass of this is equal to the density multiplied by the volume, which is equal to the density, and the volume of this uh, shape is equal to rho, uh, sorry, is equal to the height, multiplied by a n, divided by 3. And when you insert these
you'll find that whatever, even if the object is moving, that the horizontal component of T n is equal to sigma one one a one over a n plus sigma two one a two over a n plus sigma three one a three over a n, which is equal to sigma one one n one plus sigma two one n two plus sigma three one n three. So the horizontal component is equal to these components multiplied by n1, n2, and n3. And if you repeat this for tn2 and tn3, you'll find that tn1, tn2, tn3, which are the components of the traction vector tn acting on a general area, implied and with a normal of n is equal to sigma 1, 1 Sigma 2, 1, sigma 3, 1, sigma 1, 2, sigma 1, 3, sigma 2, 2, sigma 3, 2, multiplied by n1, n2, n3. So to describe the stress at a point, I need those nine numbers. This is called Cauchy stress tensor. I guess developed by a mathematician and a, an engineer in the 1700s. I don't remember his first name. And ever since, it has been used for the description of the stress at any point. In fact, this is probably the starting the, the, the starting point of developing matrices. Okay. So. nine numbers. Another thing from physics one of the physics laws that we're going to use will lead to that this those nine numbers are actually instead of nine we actually need only six and the stress matrix is symmetric. rotating in space and this Q has these stresses acting on it Euler's law states that the sum of moments around point A to the rate of change of angular momentum. So the sum of force, uh, the sum of moments of the forces around point A, this force will cancel this force, this force will cancel this force. I'm going to be left with, left with sigma on two and sigma on uh, two one. And this is a stress, which is a force per unit area, so I have to multiply by the area. So sigma 1, 2 multiplied by delta x1, delta x2, delta x3, assuming this is positive, minus 
were the dimensions of cube are equal to delta x1, delta x2, and delta x3. So sigma on 2 minus sigma 2 1, delta x1, delta x2, delta x3. This is equal to the rate of change of angular momentum. The rate of change of angular momentum is equal to, let's look at my object, rotating around this point A, assuming that it's rotating with a velocity that's equal to angular momentum multiplied by R, where R is this point. Then the angular momentum is equal to the integral of r, omega r, multiplied by dm. Which is equal to r omega r rho multiplied by dx1 dx2 and delta x3 which is equal to rho omega r squared is equal to x1 squared plus x2 squared integrated over delta x1 dx2 where this is x1 and this is x2 x1 is integrated from 0 to delta x1 x2 is integrated from 0 to delta x2 and you'll get rho omega delta x1 delta x2, delta x3, over 3, multiplied by delta x1 squared, plus delta x2 squared. change of this quantity. The rate of change of quantity, the density assumed will not change with time. It's equal to rho omega dot, the angular acceleration, multiplied by this over 3, multiplied by this. And when you take the limit, so when you put this back, by delta x1, delta x2, delta x3 first, and then take the limit, you'll find This will be equal to zero, meaning that sigma two is always equal to sigma two one, whether the object is rotating or not rotating or moving in space or not. So under any condition, if 
55. Look at a cube, a very small cube, under the magnifying glass, I will find that this stress is equal to this stress. If, if this is not true, what you will find is that the, the, the small particles inside that object are going to start moving with respect to each other, or realigning with respect to each other. But because this object, we assume it's continuous, or continuous and it stays intact, and there are no internal moments inside, there is no realignment of the, 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 the material points, then we always get that the stress sigma 2 1 is equal to sigma 1 2. The stress matrix is a 3 by 3 matrix that is symmetric. It inherits everything, all the properties of symmetric matrices. And one of the properties of the symmetric matrices, there is a coordinate system in which this matrix is diagonal. So depending on the coordinate system, it has a different representation. And so, if this is a general coordinate system with nine numbers representing a tensor or a matrix and physically representing the forces acting on these planes, mathematically, we know that there is a coordinate system, a special coordinate system, in which this matrix is diagonal. These diagonal components are the uh, eigenvalues of the matrix, and these this is the, 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 these vectors are the eigenvectors of the matrix. Physically speaking. So, in terms of physics, what this means is that a, a cube oriented along these directions will only have these components and will not have any shear components. And so, whether there is shear or not really depends on the orientation. So, whenever you say there is shear stress, that's because you're looking at a certain orientation. If you change your orientation, you will find no shear stress. The concept of shear stress really depends on the orientation that you're looking at. Because there's always an orientation where there's no shear stress. Now we call these sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. They are termed the principal stresses. And E prime 1 e prime 2, e prime 3, are the principal stress directions. But they are the eigenvalues of this stress and the eigenvectors of the stress matrix. So this is, uh, in a plane state of stress, the stress matrix here is given in this point system, e1, e2, is given by 4, 2, 0, 2, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Find the coordinate system in which the stress matrix is diagonal. Just find sigma prime. Sorry, just find, find the eigen system of sigma. And you'll get two eigen. The three eigenvalues and three eigenvectors, and when you change your coordinate system from this to the new coordinate system described by the eigenvectors, you're going to get that sigma prime will be equal to, for this particular problem, will be equal to 5 this orientation I only have 5. And this is just important to notice that this matrix which only has one number, 5, and this matrix that has 4, 1, and 2, they both describe exactly the same state of stress. 
The difference is just the orientation that I'm looking at. So what is then the normal and what is the shear? The normal and the shear stresses acting on a plane are simply the components of the traction vector perpendicular to that plane. So if this is n, and this is the traction vector. Or the force per unit area acting on this plane, <coughs> then the normal stress is this component. And when we talk about the orthogonal projection, what is this component? Exactly, it's Tn dot n. And I'm only want the value, so it's only Tn dot n. The shear stress is the norm of this vector. This vector z is equal to Tn minus this component in the direction of n. The shear stress is equal to norm z, which is equal to norm Tn minus sigma n, n. Now, it's very important to know what, what is a vector and what is a number. T, n, n, and z are vectors. Sigma n, which is equal to T, n, dot n, is a number. The shear stress, which is equal to norm z, is a positive number. So there are a few problems that you should let, look at, but the important problem that I would want you to look to uh, notice is this, the, the particular stress state where the stress is given by this matrix. Whatever the value of P is. So a particular stress state where it's called a hydrostatic stress state, where the stress is equal to P from all directions. So if I orient my cube like this, I get P, P, and P, and that's course inside the cube, the cube inside the material, I'm looking under the magnifying glass. Inside here I have P, P, and P. And the question is what if I line my cube at a different orientation? What will I get? You will always get the same orientation. In fact, if I want to find the normal stress and the shear stress on any inclined surface, so assume any inclined surface, I would like to find the normal stress and the shear stress on any inclined surface. With n vector, the traction vector on this n is equal to the sigma transpose multiplied by n. Now sigma is equal to p multiplied by i, where p is a real number. So this is equal to p i n, which is equal to a number multiplied by the vector n. So we see that tn is always in the same direction of n. The normal stress on any plane is equal to the dot product of tn dot n, which is equal to p n dot n, n dot n is 1, so p. And the shear stress is equal to tn minus 
is equal to normal stress rate called sigma n minus sigma n n, which is equal to Pn minus Pn, always equal to zero. So the shear stress on any plane. So basically, if I take any cube and put it underneath the ocean, where the hydrostatic stress is equal from all directions, then any plane on that piece will have no sh shear stress. So the, the decision has to be a function of invariance of that matrix rather than just particular numbers. Because if, if somebody says, oh, 5 is greater than 4, so this is more severe, then this is not correct. These two cases exactly describe the same stress at that particular point. And so we need to make, our, to make a decision. The, the decision has to be based on invariance of the stress matrix. And the invariance of the stress matrix are as follows. The first invariant is the hydrostatic stress. The hydrostatic stress is defined as the average normal stress or is equal to I1 of sigma divided by 3. What's I1 of sigma? Well, it's the diagonal components. Divided by 3. I1 of sigma, we studied this in the matrices. It's independent of the coordinate system. And it's equal to uh, the sum of so, so, sorry, the sum of the diagonal components is independent of the coordinate system, and it's equal to the sum, it's equal to sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3. And if you use a coordinate system in which the stress is diagonal, you can just use some of the principal stresses. Or the eigenvalues of the stress matrix. Now, if P is positive, Then, in linear elastic structures, we expect the local volume to increase and vice versa. If you get an average stress of, of, of positive, and if it's a linear elastic isotropic material, linear elastic isotropic, because this is not the case for other, if it's, uh, if it's not isotropic, but if it's isotropic and you apply P from all directions, uh, or, or the average P is positive, that means the, the volume is actually increasing. And, if the, and you're actually applying a, 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 an average tension on, your, uh, on that piece. Or if it's, ne if it's negative, then you're applying a compression, and the volume will decrease. The next uh, <coughs> stress measure is called the deviatoric stress tensor. So now that we have an average stress, I can take this average stress and make a matrix out of it. then take the rest and call it deviatoric stress. And 
and this I will call S. S is a, is the deviatory stress tensor, and four linear elastic isotropic structures is responsible for shape changes. So S is equal to the stress matrix minus PI. P is equal to sigma 1, 1 plus sigma 2, 2 plus sigma 3, 3 over 3 multiplied by i. Or in component form, you can say that Sij is equal to sigma ij minus 1 over 3 sigma kk delta ij. successful um, failure criterion failure criteria for mass is the von Mises failure criteria which tells me that the metal will fail once a certain combination of the stresses will reach a maximum value. Now this combination happens to be the second invariant of the deviatory stress tensor. Now what is, if, let, let's just look at the first invariant of S. I1 of S is equal to I1 of sigma minus Pi, which will be equal to sigma on 1 plus sigma 2, 2 plus sigma 3, 3 minus 3P, which is equal to 0. So this is the first invariant of S. The second invariant of S is equal to F I1 of S squared minus I1 of SS. This is 0. Now the von Mises stress is related to the second invariant, which is equal to the square root of negative 3 I2 of S which is equal to 3 over 2 I1 of SS. Or I1 of SS, you can replace it with SS in components is equal to S. SS is equal to SIJ. SJ and supposedly K, but I'm summing the first, the, the the diagonal components, summing the diagonal components, which means Sij, Sji, but S is symmetric, so I can write it Sij, Si. And summation is implied. I'm summing over I and summing over J. The von Mises stress in Stress depends on the, uh, or the there, there is a, an, an equation for the von Mises stress. Instead of using the uh, deviatoric stress matrix, you can use the von Mises stress. You can use the following equation. <coughs> if you uh, substitute for S, put sigma minus Pi, so Sij is equal to sigma Ij 
minus sigma kk over 3 delta ij. If you put this here and manipulate the equations, you end up with an equation of the following form, sigma on 1 minus sigma 2, 2 squared, plus sigma on 1 minus sigma 3, 3 squared, plus sigma 2, 2 minus sigma 3, 3 squared, plus 6 sigma 1, 2 squared, plus sigma 1, 3 squared, plus sigma 2, 3 squared. <coughs> All divided by 2. If you use a uh, foreign system in which the stress is diagonal, if the stress is diagonal, then sigma on 2 and sigma on 3 and sigma 2, 3 are 0. So you're going to be left with sigma 1 minus sigma 2 squared plus sigma 1 minus sigma 3 squared plus sigma 2 minus sigma 3 squared. that looks like this. When you calculate the one piece of stress, plug in all these numbers here, divided by 2, you will get the absolute value of sigma on 1. Sigma on 1 squared plus sigma on 1 squared divided by 2, sigma on 1 sigma on 1 squared divided by 2, you'll get 2 will cancel 2, will end up with the absolute value of sigma on 1. So the notes are 1 gives the same value for compression or tension. It works well for metals doesn't really work well if you want to use the von Mises stress for concrete. Because I the von Mises, because if a concrete is under compression, it's different if a concrete is under tension. And so the, the value, the, the, if you're using the von Mises stress for concrete, you cannot see whether this is under compression or under tension. You get the same number. Or the von Mises stress does not tell you whether this material is under compression or tension. It's also called the equivalent stress. Why is it called the equivalent stress? Because you are, I'm giving you nine numbers, and you're giving me back, the Mamisa stress is giving me back just one number. And this one number is termed the equivalent stress, because it just describes those nine numbers or six numbers with only one number that is equivalent to if I was pulling in a uniaxial direction. And that's why it's called the equivalent stress. Mises stress for pure shear In your, uh, in your book, there is, we, um, I'm not sure if you're going to need it for the assignment or not, but if you do, there is a function I've shown you, or I've given you a function by which you can use to calculate 
the von Mises stress using any stress matrix. It's just a huge equation, and it just takes time every time to plug in all the numbers in the in the in the to plug in all the numbers in your stress matrix into that equation and trying to evaluate it. So you can use Mathematica to to do it once and for all. So given a, a matrix M. You define it. So this is Mathematica code to create a function. You can define it as, so this is a matrix. We'll have we'll make it symmetric. You can define the one Mises function as follows. Put all the components here: s11 minus s22 squared plus s11 minus s33 squared, and so on. This bracket is to multiply by the half, and this bracket is for the square root. Now, if you just say one Mises of the matrix M, it will spit out the number for you right away. So now you've created a function that takes any general matrix and spits out these components. So notice, if, if you're just going to use this from, in Mathematica, to create a function you have to define, uh, define it with a colon, and you have to put a, an underscore next to the variable that appears here. Okay, so the last stress measure that we're going to talk about is the maximum shear stress. The maximum shear stress is defined as follows. The maximum shear stress is defined as the maximum difference between the principal stresses. the principal stresses, take the difference between each two, find the maximum, and this is this will give you the maximum shear stress. So why did we define it that way? Because we because this was noticed. The upper point system in which the stress matrix is diagonal, I would like to find the orientation in which I get maximum shear stress. Now what is this orientation and what is this value? Well, let's define this to be cosine theta, sine theta. So let's define a new point system. So this is E1, E2. This is E prime one, E prime two, at an angle theta. The stress here is equal to sigma one zero zero sigma two. There is a Q here that takes this coordinate system to the new coordinate system. It's equal to cosine theta, theta, sine theta, negative sine theta, cosine theta. The stress here is equal to Q sigma Q transpose. C, S, negative S, C, sigma 1, 0, 0, sigma 2, C, negative S, S, C, sigma prime will be equal to 
sigma 1 cosine squared plus sigma 2 sine squared sigma 2 minus sigma 1 cosine sine sigma 2 minus sigma 1 cosine sine sigma 2 cosine squared plus sigma 1 sine squared sorry it's defined as the maximum divided by 2 Maximum when I choose theta to be 45 degrees. So if you choose any, if you take the derivative of this with respect to theta, and say it's equal to zero, you'll find that it's equal to maximum when theta is equal to 45 degrees. sigma prime on 2, the shear stress, is equal to sigma 2 minus sigma 1, 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2, <coughs> equals to half. So it's sigma 2 minus sigma 1 over 2. And since I don't really care about the direction of the shear stress, positive or negative, I'm taking the absolute value. And if you repeat this for the other directions, you get that the maximum shear stress is equal to the maximum difference between those principal stresses. find the maximum shear stress for the following state of stress and find the so and we need to find the coordinate transformation that will produce such value. So in the past you used to use more circ to find you would if you guys remember your more circle you would find two points you draw your circle and you say well I'm going to these are the planes of the of the, these are the planes of the principal stresses where the stresses are diagonal and this is the plane at which I get the maximum shear oriented at half this angle which is 45 degrees so this is what you guys used to do in using Moore's circle the problem with Moore's circle is that it's only applicable or, or it's, it's actually a 2D representation it, it works for the 2D representation of the stress matrix so apply it to the 3D it's not, it's not that uh, straightforward and I prefer more the matrix manipulations because you, you, you understand what's actually going on and you don't have to divide angles and find angles theta and divide them by two or so I don't uh, so I'm not going to ask you about more circle in the course so let's now do what you've done using more circle but using now the, the, the the manipulations or for the matrices. So I have this coordinate system E1, E2, where the stress matrix is represented by 29, 72, to know is what is the orientation of the principal stresses. So to find the orientation of the principal stresses, find the eigen system of sigma. You get lambda 1, an eigenvalue 1, and lambda 2, an eigenvalue 2. And you'll find that this is oriented at 53.3 degrees. In this coordinate system, you'll find sigma prime to be equal to 125 and negative 25.
the new point system with the maximum shear is oriented at 45 degrees from this. In any direction, you can rotate it 45 degrees left, you can rotate it 45 degrees right, it really doesn't matter. So I'm going to rotate it 45 degrees this way. 45 degrees this way, this is the way. So first, uh, the sigma prime here is equal to 125, 0, 0, negative 25. And here I have a rotation matrix Q. I have another rotation matrix Q2 from this point system to a new point system where Q2 is equal to cosine 45, sine 45, negative sine 45, cosine 45, which means I'm rotating or I'm using another E double prime 2, sorry, E double prime 1. E double prime 2, where this angle is equal to 53.3 plus 45 degrees. In this new coordinate system, I have sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 2, sigma 2, 1, and the stress matrix sigma double prime is equal to Q2 sigma prime Q2 transpose. And if you do the calculation, you'll end up with 15, negative 75, negative 75, and 15. And it's negative 75 is equal to the 125 minus minus 25, which is 150 divided by 2. So this is 150 divided by 2. Had you rotated it in a different way, or in an opposite way, you might get a positive 75, but I don't really care whether it's positive or not. The thing to notice is that you could have obtained sigma double prime right away by simply multiplying Q2 multiplied by Q, multiplied by sigma, multiplied by Q2, Q transpose. And the order is very important. I'm using Q2 and then Q, not Q and then Q2. Okay, so we'll give you now five minutes. Yes. 